Hello, and in today's lesson we're going to be looking at alternating current, which is part of the magnetic fields topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson we're going to look at understanding how to analyse alternating current. Now, if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to understand how alternating current can be displayed on an oscilloscope, calculate the peak voltage, the root mean squared voltage, and the peak to peak voltage, and then finally, detail how an oscilloscope should be used correctly to gain accurate results, which forms part of the, th the 3.7.5.5 alternating current part of the specification in AQA A-level physics magnetic fields. So in previous lessons, we've looked at the process of electromagnetic induction. Now in this process, the first step is that a conductor and a permanent magnet must interact with each other. Then step two, there must be relative motion between this permanent magnet and the the conductor. Step three, this produces a relative change in the magnetic flux linkage in the conductor. The, and step four, the relative change in magnetic flux linkage leads to an induced EMF in the conductor. And then finally, if the conductor is part of a complete circuit, an induced current is produced in the conductor. But how do we measure this current and EMF induced? Now it depends on the type of current and EMF induced in the conductor, because there are two types of current that can be induced in a conductor. The first type is direct current. Now in direct current the charged particles all flow in the same direction in the conductor. So to produce a direct current there's a direct EMF across the conductor and this is produced when the relative motion between the conductor and the magnetic field is in the same direction. But there's a second type of current that can also be produced in a conductor and that is alternating current. Now here the charged particles all oscillate in the same formation in the conductor. So here the charged particles all move backwards and forwards in this in unison in the conductor. Now it, to produce an alternating current, an alternating EMF is required across the conductor and this is produced when the relative motion between the conductor and magnetic field is always changing direction, such as when a coil is rotating in a magnetic field. Now measuring devices such as voltmeters and ammeters are typically used in circuits to measure current and voltage but these devices can illustrate direct current and direct voltage easily however they struggle to illustrate alternating current and alternating voltage easily now to show alternating values the values would constantly be changing between positive and negative values so therefore this they would struggle to illustrate these ideas very easily. So another device must be used for alternating current and alternating voltage. So to display the voltage of an alternating current source easily, so to produce to look at an alternating potential difference or an alternating EMF, an oscilloscope must be used. Now these devices can illustrate all types of voltage easily. So to display the voltage of, of any particular source, an oscilloscope must be used. Now we can consider in a oscilloscope as an advanced voltmeter. It displays all voltages easily. Now, many oscilloscopes are connected to a signal generator as they can generate an alternating voltage easily. Now, the trace observed on an oscilloscope is made by an electron beam moving across the screen. Now, we can use the oscilloscope screen to determine key values about the alternating voltage induced. So, the display of an oscilloscope looks like the following. Now, the y-axis represents the voltage of the circuit. This could be either the EMF or the PD depending on what the oscilloscope is connected to. Now the scale of the y-axis is called the y-gain. So for example if the y-gain is set to 2 volts this means every vertical square on the oscilloscope screen represents 2 volts. Now the y-gain can be altered by the investigator in an experiment. So you will go onto your oscilloscope and you'll alter your scale as appropriate. Now to improve the accuracy of any results, the Y gain should be set so that the entire waveform can be displayed in the Y axis. Now, in addition, for an oscilloscope trace, it's important that the key parts of the waveform are placed on the axis as it makes these values easier to measure. So, this reduces random error 
and therefore increases the accuracy of the result. Now this could involve aligning the key part of the trace with a square or graduation on the oscilloscope screen. Now this means that if you do this there's no extrapolation needed when you're trying to work out the answers so as a result you get your answers more accurately. Now it's important to know that on the oscilloscope trace negative values are present to represent the possible alternating voltage nature of the voltage. Now if the line of a trace stays slow solely as either a positive or negative value it can be considered a direct current. Now the x-axis represents the time of the measurement. Now the scale of the x-axis is called the x-gain. Now for example if the x-gain is set to 20 milliseconds this means every horizontal square on the oscilloscope represents 20 milliseconds. Now like we mentioned before the x-gain can be altered by the investigator in an experiment. Now the X gain can be altered by literally moving your scaling up and down to work out a suitable scaling to use. Now to improve the accuracy of any results, the X gain should be set so the entire waveform can be displayed in the X axis. Now in addition, for an oscilloscope trace, it's important that the key parts of the waveform are placed on the axis as it makes these values easier to measure. It reduces the random error, increases the accuracy of the result. Now an oscilloscope can have its time based turned off. This means the x-axis no longer represents time and the waveform is not considered as a wave change with respect to time. So this means the wave will only be represented in the y-axis of the screen. Now it's a common examination question to consider what a trace would look like if the time base was turned off. Now in these questions you don't have to consider any time measurements. Now if the oscilloscope had its time base set off this will produce a dot if the voltage was direct. So this is an example of what the oscilloscope trace would look like if it was a direct voltage and the time base was set off. Now in addition it will produce a line if the voltage was alternating and the time base was set off as shown in this particular picture. Now it's important to know that a direct voltage produces a flat line if the time base is turned back on as the voltage does not vary with time for an electrical circuit. Now the larger the supply, the higher the line on the oscilloscope screen. So for example, we can use the Y gain of an oscilloscope trace to determine the values of the electrical circuit. So let's say the Y gain is set to 2 volts. This means in this particular example, because the line is 2.5 squares above the axis, that means the direct voltage in this trace is 5 volts due to the scaling of our Y, of our y gain. So here is an example of an oscilloscope trace for direct voltage with the time base turned on. Now let's now consider the oscilloscope trace for an alternating voltage with the time base set on. Now the potential difference varies over time as the charged particles regularly change direction. They move backwards and forwards and the pattern produced is a sine wave and the negative values in this instance means the charged particles are moving in the opposite direction and this occurs when there's a change in direction during the induction process. For example there is rotation going on. So this means that the electrons or the any charged particles move in one direction when it's a positive and they move in the other direction when it's a negative. Now voltage readings should be taken from the center point, the equilibrium position of the wave, and this is the displacement from the zero point. Now remember, this waveform for voltage is produced during electromagnetic induction for a rotating coil in a magnetic field. So here's an example of an oscilloscope trace for alternating voltage. Now for good practice, the Y gain and X gain should be altered to see the full waveform in the screen as as shown and for good practice the key parts of the wave should be placed on the axis for measurement. Now we can we can measure several key terms from an alternating voltage waveform. So the first key idea we can look at is the time period. Now the time period is the time it takes for one complete wave and we can then use this to work out the frequency because we know frequency is equal to 1 over time period. So measuring the distance between the successive peaks along the time axis gives 
gives you the time period as long as you know that time base setting. Now we can then use this to calculate frequency as frequency is equal to 1 over time period. The next thing we can look at is the peak voltage. That's the maximum voltage from equilibrium. So it can be either from equilibrium to peak or equilibrium to trough as shown on the diagram. Now the maximum voltage is a measure of the energy in the circuit. So the peak voltage measures the energy in the circuit. Now the maximum voltage is the maximum possible induced EMF in a conductor and the peak voltage can therefore be calculated with our equation for maximum possible induced EMF in a rotating conductor. E max is equal to BAN omega. Now the next particular key term we can look at is the peak to peak voltage. So this is the maximum negative voltage to the maximum positive voltage. Now again this is a measure of the energy of the circuit. Now interestingly to lower percentage uncertainties in measurements it's easier to measure the peak to peak voltage from the oscilloscope and then half it to find the peak voltage. Now we can also have a look at this waveform when a coil is rotating in a magnetic field. Now if the coil is made to rotate faster the time period would decrease in our wave but the peak voltage would increase as there's a greater change in magnetic flux linkage. Whilst if the coil is placed in a stronger magnetic field, the, vol the peak voltage would increase as there's a greater change in flux linkage, but the time period would remain unchanged. Now it's important to note that neither the peak voltage nor the peak to peak voltage provides a comparison to the equivalent direct voltage. This comes from an average voltage calculation. Now the average voltage of an alternating supply is needed when comparing to the voltage of a direct supply. Now the peak cannot be used as the supply will normally be lower than the peak for an alternating supply because the peak is only the maximum possible value. But we've got an issue. A simple average cannot be taken of an alternating voltage. This is because an average voltage of an alternating current would equal zero due to the positive and negative voltages in the trace cancelling each other out. So this is similar to when we're asked to find the average speed of randomly moving particles. They would all average out to an average speed of zero if we didn't carry out a principle to solve this issue. So we've got to use this same principle to solve this issue. We've got to use the root mean square voltage as the average voltage of an alternating supply. So the root mean square voltage is a measure of the average voltage found in an alternating voltage supply. And we can work this out by, with the equation VRMS, the root mean squared voltage is equal to V0, the peak voltage, divided by square root 2. Now the root mean squared voltage needs to be used, otherwise any average value would equal 0 and not be a true measure of the energy found in the circuit. Now it is important to know that this equation, VRMS is equal to V0 over the square root of 2, is stated in your examination equation booklet. Now this is also the stated value of voltage for alternating voltages. So for example, you have learned previously that the mains potential difference has a voltage of 230 volts. Well, that's actually the root mean square voltage of the alternating main supply. Now, this leads us to our current equivalence, where I RMS is equal to I0 over square root 2, where I0 is the peak current, and therefore... The root mean square voltage and the root mean square current allow for the electrical power of an alternating power supply to be calculated, where power is equal to VRMS times by IRMS, which comes from our basic equation P equals VI, but we're now considering the average values of each of them in the alternating supply. Now, it's important to know that this equation is not given to you for your examination. So let's have a look at an example question. A light is powered by by an AC power supply with a peak voltage of 2.12 volts and a root mean square current of 0 0.40 amps. So firstly, calculate the root mean square voltage of the power supply. Well, VRMS is equal to V0 over square root 2. So we will do 2.12, the peak voltage, over square root 2, so you get 1.499 or 1.50 volts. Now let's then calculate the power of this power supply. Well, when it's an 
AC power supply, we say power equals IRMS times by VRMS. We know IRMS is 0 0.40. We just calculated VRMS to be 1.499. So it's 0 0.40 times by 1.499 equals 0.5996 which is 0 0.60 watts so what have we learned in today's lesson sinusoidal voltages and currents are can be worked out and you can have a root mean square a peak to peak and a peak value for sinusoidal waveforms only and we know irms is equal to i0 over square root 2 and vrms is equal to v0 over square root 2 and applications to the calculations of mains electricity peak and peak to peak Peak voltage values and you can use an oscilloscope as a DC and AC voltmeter to measure time intervals and frequencies and to display AC waveforms. Now no details of the structure of the instrument are required but familiarity with the operation of the controls is expected. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson we can understand how alternating current can be displayed on an oscilloscope. We can calculate the peak voltage, the root mean square voltage and the peak to peak voltage and we can then detail how an oscilloscope should be used correctly to gain accurate results. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on alternating current, which is part of the magnetic fields topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for listening to today's lesson and have a lovely day.